Napoleon Bonaparte, born on the small island of Corsica, is one of the most famous men to have ever lived, hailed as the man of the 19th century. Even his very name is used as a word to describe something momentous, colossal, Napoleonic. A rags to riches story, Napoleon was only 24 years old when he became a general, and 35 when he crowned himself Emperor of the French. Charismatic leader of men, shrewd politician, and a military genius, Napoleon fought 60 battles in his career and only lost seven of them, making him the most victorious general in history. Not since the days of ancient Rome and the Caesars had one man conquered so much of Europe or held so much power. As a ruler of France and its empire for nearly 15 years, Napoleon was also a reformer and improver. He played a leading role in solidifying the gains and ideals of the French Revolution, promoting equality and careers open to talent, securing religious freedom and tolerance, ending aristocratic and feudal privilege, and founding the Civil Code, a unified and progressive code of laws, which are still in use across Europe to this day. Napoleon's empire helped provide the basis of what is today the European Union. For this reason, Napoleon is often considered the father of modern Europe, and ever since him, the world was never really the same. To this day, Napoleon remains one of the most written about men in history, second only to Jesus Christ. Inspiring masterpieces of music, art, literature and poetry, from Beethoven's stirring third symphony to Tolstoy's War and Peace, few fictional characters have ever done as much as Napoleon Bonaparte. The so-called man of destiny and a mass of contradictions, Napoleon is still something of an enigma, both a hopeless romantic idealist and the bitterest of cynics. The combination of his irresistible charm when he chose to deploy it, his iron will, workaholic habits, inspirational speeches and sayings, sheer intellect and of course his fiery temperament, captivated or alarmed. To some he was a god, to others the Antichrist. And his meteoric rise and then crushing downfall has been compared to a Greek tragedy. After less than 15 years in power, in the last of seven wars formed against him by coalitions of European monarchs, Napoleon was finally defeated at the Battle of Waterloo and exiled to the remote rocky island of St. Helena in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. At the end of his life, reflecting on his misfortunes, Napoleon's analysis was, I have too much ambition and a spirit of fire. This is the story of Napoleon and the dawn of a new age. Napoleon's conquest of Italy, and later of Egypt, made him a household name, cementing his self-belief and his powers of leadership. Most crucially of all, Napoleon was to take his first steps into diplomacy and European politics, founding states and toppling thrones, forging constitutions and exporting French revolutionary ideas. His early conquests paved the way for the foundation and character of his later rule and French Empire. Napoleon's Italian campaign was his debut on the world stage, taking command of a ragged army devoid of hope and transforming it into a victorious fighting force, which in less than one year would defeat no less than six successive enemy armies, despite the French being constantly outnumbered. Napoleon's initial victories would be swift. After Napoleon's first battle in command at Montenot and the death-defying passage of the bridge at Lodi, neither Napoleon or the continent would ever be the same again. In the 21st century, we still resign ourselves to wars for contingent goals, but in war itself, we see nothing redeeming and little that we readily associate with words like moral or spiritual. Conquerors like Alexander the Great or Napoleon are readily likened to mass murderers like Hitler and Stalin. Today, generals are respected for the punches they pull, the cities they do not take, and for the lives their actions perhaps save. 
including the enemies. But the people of the 18th century, as in past periods of European history, largely looked at things differently. Of course, they had no great liking for the suffering, destruction and inconvenience of war. But they also saw war as potentially ennobling and glorious. They saw it as a theatre of life, where a huge spectacle of human grandeur and greatness, and of course misery, unfolded. They respected it as well as feared it, and above all, they admired great warriors, particularly when they were conquerors. If we do not understand that, then we shall not see how Napoleon Bonaparte's accomplishments as the so-called God of War made him so widely respected and even loved, not only in France, but among many who lived in rival nations. At his headquarters at Albenga, Napoleon studied his map. The Austrian army had 30,000 men, and their allies, the Piedmontese, had 25,000 men. In this respect, the enemy outnumbered them and had the edge. What's more, in mountain warfare, the defenders, which the enemy were, always hold the advantage. The Austrian commander, General Beaulieu, was talented and experienced, but he was 71 years old and had been beaten by French armies before. Plus, he did not know Italy. Having studied past campaigns, Napoleon knew that Beaulieu was cautious, a flaw he planned to exploit. Other French generals had tried to cross into Piedmont over the Alps for the past three years. The passes being few, narrow and well protected, they had failed. Napoleon had already decided to abandon this option. Instead, he chose to move along the coast and make a faint march towards neutral Genoa, the port used by the British to supply their continental allies. And in doing so, he would draw the Austrians down from their mountain base. Then, not against the expected target, Genoa, Napoleon would swing up from the sea and pass through the gap which divided the mountains of the Alps from the Apennines. Through this gap, Napoleon would advance into Piedmont, to Dago. Here he would strike fast and hard at the enemy which, in trying to protect Genoa, would have dangerously extended its lines. Napoleon, with 38,000 troops, outnumbered the Piedmontese and the Austrian army. But if they combine, he will be outnumbered, so Napoleon had to prevent this at all costs. Napoleon's daring manoeuvre, now known in military academies as the strategy of the central position, involved remaining between the two forces opposing him and striking first at one, then at the other before they could join up, prizing his enemies apart. It was a strategy Napoleon would adhere to throughout his career. Only when their forces were numerically smaller than his own would he attempt to tackle them, forcing them one by one to battle. War is the science of barbarians, and he who has the heaviest battalions will conquer. Napoleon knew that when threatened, the Piedmontese would retreat on their capital Turin, the Austrians on Milan. With his enemies divided, unable to support each other, he would defeat both, one by one. His plan bears all the hallmarks of what will become known as the Napoleonic art of war. The first step in Napoleon's campaign was an adroit tactic. To fool the Austrian commander, Beaulieu, Napoleon began by asking Genoa for permission to march through their territory against the Austrians, knowing full well that they would refuse and inform the Austrians. Napoleon had no intention of going to Genoa, on the contrary, he was going to march north, but Beaulieu fell into the trap. While gloating, it will be a pleasure to give an elementary lesson in military tactics to this Giovanazzi di Buonaparte, this brat Bonaparte. Beaulieu is convinced that the French will target Genoa, so much so that he rejects Piedmontese plans for close cooperation. Their troops remain scattered across mountain passes in a general defence against invasion, while the Austrians march to the sea to cut off the French advance. Next, Napoleon, behind the curtain of the Alps, divided his army into three divisions and was soon on the move. At a given hour, the different divisions of the army were, by various roads, to arrive at a designated point. To accomplish this, if necessary, stragglers were to be left behind, baggage abandoned, artillery even left in the ruts by the side of the road. Napoleon made it a rule that his generals were to write their reports by the hour, not just each day. This was because his manoeuvres depended on flawless timing. As Napoleon faced the enemy, he felt anticipation, writing to Josephine, the two armies are in motion, each trying to outwit the other. The more skillful will succeed. I am much pleased with Beaulieu. 
He manoeuvres very well, and is superior to his predecessor. I shall beat him, I hope, out of his boots. But Beaulieu strikes first. On the 10th of April, Austrian troops take Voltry to disrupt the expected French attack on Genoa. The small French garrison falls back, but Beaulieu's fixation with Genoa is playing into Napoleon's hands. Dago, with its vital crossroads that link the Piedmontese and Austrian armies, is covered by just 8,000 men of Argenteau's corps. Mountainous terrain means that Beaulieu can only march to Argenteau's aid via Acqui, more than 20 miles to the north. What's more, Argenteau has orders to take the French positions at Montenot as a diversion. But the French cling on courageously. The commander, Colonel Rompon, tells his men, here we must conquer or die, a moment which quickly enters French military folklore. This is the perfect setup for Napoleon. The enemy's attention is focused on Voltry, and the Austrians at Montenot have been left dangerously exposed. Napoleon swings into action, sending La Harpe's division to reinforce Rampon's troops, while Massena makes a tough night march across the steep ravines in rain and fog to turn Argenteau's right flank. The night of the 11th of April was dark and stormy. Torrential rain was falling, and the miry roads were almost impassable. While the Austrians were resting warmly in their tents, Napoleon and his soldiers, drenched in rain, were toiling up the muddy, slippery mountain paths. Just as day began to break, Napoleon stood on the heights behind Montenot and looked down at the encamped Austrian army, who he was, for the first time, to encounter in battle. Not allowing his weary troops any time to rest, Napoleon watched as his hungry, ill-equipped men attacked 10,000 impeccably uniformed Austrians who lacked nothing. But Napoleon's troops fell on the enemy like a whirlwind, attacking them at the same moment from the front, the side and the rear. The perfectly synchronized strike took the enemy by surprise. The Austrians were broken and fled the battlefield in a rout, leaving behind their cannon and colors to the French. With few losses, the French killed or wounded a thousand Austrians and took 2,500 prisoners. The Battle of Montenot, fought in the cold rain, was the first battle in which Napoleon held the supreme command and his first victory. My title of nobility dates from the Battle of Montenot, Napoleon would later tell the Emperor of Austria. Now, the right and left flank of the enemy army was divided and its centre was broken. By a series of clever feints, moving at breakneck speed northwards, Napoleon prevented the various divisions of the enemy from uniting. The Austrians fled in one direction to Dago, to meet reinforcements coming to their aid and to try to protect Milan. Therefore, the Austrians and Piedmontese were separated, just as Napoleon desired. Napoleon then orders Massena to move on Dago, while he turns his attention to the Piedmontese. But Augereau's advance guard gets held up at Caseria. The old castle is held by Piedmontese and Croatian grenadiers. The French launch frontal attacks into withering fire and suffer hundreds of casualties. I have never seen fire like it, wrote Marmont, Napoleon's friend and aide-de-camp. Despite heroic resistance, the hopelessly outnumbered Piedmontese garrison surrenders the next day. The 13th and 14th of April were passed in one long conflict. At Melissimo, 1,500 Piedmontese were finally defeated, thanks to rapid marching, with favourable odds of 16 to 10, and they were forced to surrender. This victory was even more crushing than the last, as the French successfully captured a whole corps. With Sir Rurier's division also advancing from the south, Piedmontese commander, General Colli, has little choice but to abandon his position at Monsamolo. The same day, under Napoleon's watchful eye, Massena takes Dago. But while La Harpe's division moves off to reinforce Augereau, hungry French troops left in Dago turn to pillage and plunder. No one spots Colonel Vukasevich, a tough Croatian commander, approaching with 3,000 reinforcements. Masona was caught off guard, quite literally with his pants down. Characteristically, he was in bed with a woman, and when Vukasevich attacked at dawn, he had to escape through the window in his nightshirt. The Austrians routed the French and retook Dago with ease. Laab's division has to be recalled, and another day of heavy combat fought before Vukasevich can be driven out of Dago. The enemy were forced to abandon their artillery and baggage and escape over the mountains, leaving 3,000 prisoners in French hands. 
It was at Dago that Napoleon was first particularly struck by the courage of a young officer named Lan, who had become one of his closest friends. Like a thunderbolt, Napoleon opened the campaign. In three days, three desperate battles and three decisive victories had been gained. For 96 hours, almost non-stop, Napoleon had marched his army up and down the steep foothills of the Alps, across passes, through defiles, and thrown his troops into four major battles. Under their new commander, the compact French divisions had run circles around the enemy in a way never before known. So far, Napoleon had done nothing drastic strategically or tactically, but under his hand, the army and its officers had performed the familiar routines of march and countermarch, attack and fallback, feint and envelopment, so efficiently and so swiftly that they struck with the force of the new. Now the enemy was dispersed and divided. Napoleon now advanced to the summit of Mount Zamolo. From this height, the French troops saw the promised land, the rich and fertile plains of Italy, opening up beneath them. As cries of joy broke out from the ranks, Napoleon, sitting on his horse, silently admired the scene. Pointing to the distant mountains, Napoleon exclaimed, Hannibal crossed the Alps, but we have turned them. The French troops rushed down the mountain slopes, and crossing the Tanaro River, found themselves in the sunny plains of Italy. But still, there was not a moment to be lost, as from every direction, the Austrians and Piedmontese were hurrying to their appointed positions to combine to destroy this army. The Austrians are regrouping at Acqui and will soon retreat to Alessandria. They can offer no support to the Piedmontese. Sending Augereau to pursue the Austrian army, now driven back and separated from their allies, Napoleon began to pursue the Piedmontese in their flight toward Turin. He came upon them on the 18th at Cheva, where they had entrenched themselves 8,000 strong. Napoleon attacked them immediately. During the rest of that day, a bloody battle raged without any decisive result, until it grew dark. Napoleon then rested his men, who slept with weapons at the ready, to resume the fight at dawn. In the night, however, the Piedmontese fled, and took another strong position behind the deep and foaming torrent of the Carsuglia. By the evening of the next day, Napoleon had again overtaken them, and orders an immediate attack. Orderer's division on the right, Sirochier on the left, Massena in support. But the French, under heavy fire, struggled to cross the deep banked and swollen river. When Sirochier's troops finally get into Saint Michel, they immediately begin looting the town and are thrown out by a counter attack. The Piedmontese were so strongly entrenched, it seemed difficult to conceive how they could be dislodged, while reinforcements were rushing to their aid. A council of war was held in the night, and despite their troops' exhaustion, the French decided to make an assault on the bridge at dawn. But the Piedmontese had panicked and again fled during the night. Despite his successful stand, the Piedmontese general Colley was still heavily outnumbered and feared encirclement. That evening, he'd begun a covert withdrawal to Mondovi. But Napoleon is not deceived by the fake campfires he'd set up. Patrols confirm his suspicions. The Piedmontese are pulling back. Before the first grey of the morning, the French were moving down on the bridge in battle formation. Napoleon, pleased with his good fortune, passed the bridge unobstructed. Though his troops are exhausted, wet and hungry, Napoleon launches them after the fleeing enemy. He pressed forward with the pursuit, and before nightfall had again overtaken the Piedmontese, who had positioned themselves on some almost inaccessible hills near Mondovi. The French immediately advanced to battle, Colley's troops are caught before they can establish a new defensive line, and Napoleon's men again triumph, while the Piedmontese fled, leaving 2,000 men, 8 cannon and 11 standards in their hands, and 1,000 dead on the field. The French enter Mondovi in triumph, where at last, briefly, they can eat and rest. Napoleon then pursued them to Churrasco, and took possession of the town. The French were now within 20 miles of Turin, the capital of the Piedmontese kingdom. Napoleon marched forward and announced his terms for peace. Meanwhile, General Beaulieu is at long last marching to Piedmont's aid, but he is a week too late. And when he learns that Piedmont has opened negotiations with the French, he withdraws his troops in disgust, planning to take up new positions along the Po River. 
Austrian troops join in the plunder of Piedmontese villages as they go. In Italy, these victories were scarcely believed. In ten days, the rag heroes, who had been a laughing stock for the past three years, had defeated two well-fed armies, 10,000 men stronger than themselves, among the best fighting men in Europe, and had taken every position of importance in Piedmont, except Turin, which Napoleon might march on at any moment. Piedmont had been at war with France for over four years, but now, in less than a fortnight, it was all over. Napoleon proclaimed to his soldiers, Soldiers, you have been fighting for barren rocks, made memorable by your valour, but useless to the nation. Your exploits now equal those of the conquering armies of Holland and the Rhine. You were utterly destitute, and have supplied all your wants. You have gained battles without cannons, passed rivers without bridges, performed forced marches without shoes, bivouacked without brandy, and often without bread. None but Republican phalanxes, soldiers of liberty, could have borne what you have endured. For this you have the thanks of your country. The two armies which recently attacked you in full confidence now fly before you in consternation. But soldiers, it must not be concealed that you have accomplished nothing while anything remains to be done. Neither Turin nor Milan is in your hands. I am told that there are some among you whose courage is failing, who wish to return to the summits of the Alps and the Apennines. No, I cannot believe it. The conquerors of Montenot, of Melissima, of Dago, of Mondovi, burn to carry still further the glories of the French name. But before I lead you to conquest, there is one condition you must promise to fulfill, that is, to protect the people whom you liberate, and to repress all acts of lawless violence. Without this, you would not be the deliverers, but the scourge of nations. Invested with the national authority, strong in justice and law, I shall not hesitate to enforce the requisitions of humanity and of honour. I will not suffer robbers to sully your laurels. The greatest difficulties are no doubt surmounted, but you still have battles to fight, towns to take, rivers to cross. Meanwhile, Napoleon's victories were all too quick, all too bewildering for the King of Piedmont, and believing that Napoleon, irritated by a prolonged conflict, might then proclaim liberty to his people and dethrone him, the King decided to throw himself into the arms of the French. Napoleon was relieved to receive his overtures. The King of Sardinia had still a great number of fortresses left, and in spite of the victories which had been gained, the slightest check, one caprice of fortune would have undone everything. The Allied army still far outnumbered his own, and Napoleon had neither the heavy battering cannon nor siege equipment to besiege Turin and the other important fortresses of the kingdom. And far from home, he could expect no immediate reinforcements from France, while his own army was still destitute. The King of Piedmont sent two envoys to seek an armistice with Napoleon, Salier de la Tour and Costa de Beauregard. They arrived at Napoleon's lodgings at 11 at night, on the 27th of April. Berthier woke Napoleon up, who came down in his general's uniform, but with no sword, hat or scarf. He had clearly just been woken up. His hair was gathered loosely, he was pale, and his eyes looked tired. Napoleon listened in silence while Salier put forward proposals. Instead of a direct answer, Napoleon asked curtly whether the king accepted the French terms, yes or no. When one of the envoys suggested terms, which left him with fewer fortresses than he desired, he sardonically replied, The Republic, in entrusting to me the command of an army, has credited me with possessing another discernment of what that army requires, without having recourse to the advice of my enemy. Salier complained that the towns were too harsh, especially the surrender of Cuneo. Since drawing them up, Napoleon replied, I have since captured Chirasco, Fasano and Alba. You ought to consider the terms moderate. Salier then mumbled a phrase about not wanting to desert their allies, the Austrians. Napoleon's answer was to pull out his watch. It is one o'clock. I have ordered an attack at two. Unless you agree to hand over Cuneo this morning, that attack will take place. The envoys exchanged a look and agreed to sign. They asked for coffee, and Napoleon sent for some, but he didn't have any spoons, and they had to make do with brass army issue cutlery. When Costa commented on this Spartan simplicity, Napoleon explained that his portmanteau was his only baggage, less than he used to carry as a simple artillery officer. The Austrians, he said, carried too much baggage. In their hour-long conversation, Napoleon took Costa out to the balcony to watch the sunrise and questioned him about Piedmont's resources, artists and intellectuals, surprising him with his knowledge, especially of history. Napoleon likened his troop movements to the combat of young Horatius, distancing his three enemies so as to disable them and kill them in succession. 
He said that he was not actually the youngest French general, though he admitted that his age was an asset. Youth is almost indispensable in commanding an army. So necessary are high spirits, daring and pride to such a great task. Another Piedmontese officer, meeting Napoleon for the first time, wrote that the impression one had of this young man was one of painful admiration. The intellect was dazzled by the superiority of his talents. Among Napoleon's orders from Paris, he was instructed to secure and send back works of art for the enjoyment of the French people. The government ordered, leave nothing in Italy which our political situation will permit you to carry away, and which may be useful to us. Referring to the treaty just signed, Napoleon said to the envoy, I thought of demanding Gerard Dou's painting of the woman with dropsing, which belongs to King Victor, but itemised alongside the fortress of Cuneo, I was afraid it would appear a bizarre innovation. Fearless innovator on the battlefield, Napoleon was afraid of risking ridicule by doing something unusual when it came to a treaty. At six in the morning, an old face arrived, the Corsican Salicetti, his one-time friend. Napoleon, having clearly forgiven him for having had him imprisoned a few years ago in Antibes, had found him a post reorganising the army. Salicetti thought of the war in terms of loot for himself, and money to send home to the impoverished directory. Salicetti asked about the terms of the treaty, and was annoyed that Napoleon had not squeezed more out of the Piedmontese. The treaty forced the king to abandon the alliance with Austria, surrender three fortresses with all the artillery and military stores to Napoleon, disband the militia, and disperse their regular troops, allow the French free use of the military roads to carry on the war with Austria, and to send an ambassador to Paris to conclude a definitive peace, with the result that Savoy and Nice were annexed to France. But the treaty, Salicetti said, was too moderate. Napoleon intended to be moderate, he saw the war in northern Italy differently from Salicetti. He was fighting the Austrians, but he was also liberating the northern Italians from them, as he stated in one proclamation. Peoples of Italy, the French army has come to break your chains. The French people are the friends of all nations. In them you may confide. We shall respect your property, your religion and your customs. We only wage war with generous hearts. Our sole quarrel is against the tyrants who enslave you. A majority of Napoleon's soldiers and officers severely condemned any peace treaty with a monarchical government and were clamouring for the King of Piedmont to be overthrown and a republic established. But Napoleon had seen enough of Jacobin misrule in the bloodstained streets of Paris. He had no desire to see the reign of terror re-enacted in the cities of Italy, being in favour of reform, not a revolution. So against the known wishes of the Directory, the demands of the army, and even of the Italians themselves, Napoleon refused to overthrow Piedmont's established government. Meanwhile, the humiliated King of Piedmont, who had been forced to sue for peace from an unknown 26-year-old, allegedly died of grief a few days after signing the treaty, having lost hope of his son-in-law's ever regaining the French throne. Coming down from the arid mountains into the fertile Italian plains, Napoleon was able to care for his army. He required the town of Mondovi to provide his soldiers with 8,000 rations of fresh meat and 4,000 bottles of wine, and footwear was in such short supply that the people of Acqui were obliged to sell their own boots to the French, or they would be confiscated. A victorious, hungry army pillages. General Joubert was among those frustrated by the men's conduct. Everything would go very well if the soldiers did not abandon themselves to pillage. Not a day passes without some looters being shot. Despite the severity, the mania doesn't stop. The rural folk are arming themselves. Napoleon was concerned by the conduct of his troops and wanted to keep the devastation in check, but his orders have limited impact. Four days earlier, Napoleon had published an order of the day, blaming the fearful pillage on perverse men who joined their corps only after the battle and who commit excesses which dishonor the army and the French name. He authorised his generals to shoot any officers who allowed it, though there are no examples of this actually happening. Napoleon wrote to the Directory two days later, I intend to make terrible examples. I shall restore order, or shall cease to command these brigands. This was the first of many exaggerated threats to resign that Napoleon was to make over the course of the campaign. Napoleon always differentiated between living off the land, which the army had to do because of lack of supplies, and fearful pillage. If Napoleon's troops had waited for the administration of the army to hand out rations of bread and meat, they might have starved. One officer of the time recalled, We lived upon what the soldiers found. 
A soldier never steals anything, he only finds it. Living off the land allowed Napoleon a speed of manoeuvre that was to become an essential element of his strategy. The strength of the army, like power in mechanics, is the product of multiplying the mass by the velocity. Napoleon encouraged everything that helped faster movement, including the use of forced marches, which more or less doubled the 15 miles a day that demi-brigades could move. One of his officers recalled, no man ever knew how to make an army march like Napoleon. These marches were frequently very fatiguing. Sometimes half the soldiers were left behind. But as they never lacked goodwill, they did arrive, though they arrived later. Lighter field guns, more roads, smaller baggage trains, and far fewer camp followers helped Napoleon's armies to move at what he calculated to be twice the speed of Julius Caesar's. By bringing Piedmont to its knees, Napoleon in two weeks had succeeded where his predecessors had failed for the past four years. But his army has little time to rest on its laurels. Four days later, having received 7,000 reinforcements and fresh supplies, it's on the move again. Having raised morale, Napoleon prepared his army for the next task. Napoleon plans to invade the rich province of Lombardy, ruled by the Emperor of Austria, and to defeat the Austrian general Beaulieu, who had fled beyond the River Po, clearly thinking they could use this barrier to prevent the French from entering Lombardy. Napoleon had recently told the Directory that crossing this river would be a tough operation and warned them not to listen to the soldiers of the clubs, who believe we can swim across broad rivers. The crossing of the Po River would prove one of Napoleon's most brilliant manoeuvres. The French set out in pursuit of the Austrians. After occupying Alessandria and capturing a large amount of Austrian provisions there, Napoleon followed the right bank of the wide river to try to seek a crossing of it, defying the enemy who were arrayed in vastly superior numbers on the other side of the bank. It is one of the most difficult operations in warfare to cross a river in the face of an opposing army, and it was difficult to see how Napoleon could achieve it. When Napoleon reached the river, he found it to be 500 yards wide. His troops gloomily eyed the vast expanse of brown water and laid bets that a crossing would take at least two months. Massene is ordered to make conspicuous preparations to cross the river near Salé, assembling boats and building gun batteries. By a feint, Napoleon would again deceive Beaulieu into thinking he would try to cross the river here. Then suddenly by night, Napoleon made a dash for Piacenza in the Dukedom of Parma, which was neutral, although Napoleon knew its duke to be hostile. They were to cover 40 miles in just 36 hours, seizing every boat as they passed along the river. Beaulieu receives reports that French troops are moving east and begins to redeploy his forces, while remaining conscious that there are still French troops that might cross the River Po as far west as Valenza. This uncertainty makes it impossible for him to concentrate his forces. What's more, he's completely underestimated the scale and speed of Napoleon's move. Napoleon sent an intrepid young officer, Lan, in command of 900 men, across the river in boats and he scoured the riverbank for miles. Land crosses the Po on the 7th of May, chasing off Austrian patrols that are the only opposition. By the next morning, most of La Harpe's and Augereau's divisions and the cavalry are across, consolidating the French bridgehead, while Massena and Sir Rurier move to the crossing as fast as possible. He had timed the march of the several divisions of his army so precisely that all of his forces met at the appointed rendezvous within a few hours of each other. Napoleon succeeded in getting his whole army across the river in just two days, before the Austrians were even aware of it, bypassing several river defence lines and threatening Milan itself. This was the first example of what was to become another of Napoleon's favourite strategies, the manoeuvre sur les derrières, getting behind the enemy. Napoleon then swept up towards Milan, outflanking the main Austrian army. Without the loss of a single man, Napoleon found himself and his army in the plains of Lombardy, which had before been conquered by the Austrians and was governed by an archduke. Lombardy contained 1.2 million people and was one of the most fertile and rich provinces in the world. A great many of its inhabitants were dissatisfied with their foreign masters. Longing for political regeneration, they were ready to welcome the armies of France. Napoleon was jubilant. He wrote to the Directory, when Beaulieu learned what had happened, he realised too late that his fortifications on the Ticino and his redoubts at Pavia were useless, and that the French Republicans were not so inept as Francois I. 
Napoleon also wrote to Carnot, We have at last crossed the Po. The second campaign has commenced. Beaulieu is disconcerted. He miscalculates and continually falls into snares. Perhaps he wishes to give battle, for he has both audacity and energy, but not genius. As soon as Beaulieu heard that Napoleon had outgeneraled him, having crossed the river, he immediately collected all his forces and moved forward to meet him. The two armies soon clashed at Fombio. The Austrians stationed themselves in this village, in the steeples, at the windows and on the roofs of the houses, and began to rain down fire on the French who were crowding into the streets. The Austrians hoped to stop their progress so that General Beaulieu could arrive with the main body of the army. That evening, Beaulieu's advance guard arrives, expecting to reinforce Lepfay. Instead, they blunder into La Harpe's division. The French rushed on with their bayonets and the Austrians were repulsed and retreated, leaving 2,000 prisoners in Napoleon's hands. In confused night fighting, General La Harpe is shot dead, possibly by friendly fire. The Republic, Napoleon wrote of him, has lost a man who was very dear to it, the army one of its best generals, and every soldier a fearless comrade. Napoleon then wrote to the French ambassador to Switzerland to ensure that La Harpe's estate there, which had been confiscated during the revolution, was returned to his six children. In Piacenza, whose governor opened the city gates for Napoleon, after a short but frank explanation of what would happen to his city otherwise, Napoleon predicted to the war minister Carnot, one more victory and we are masters of Italy. Horses were requisitioned so that mules no longer had to pull the artillery and so many of Napoleon's cannons were drawn by coach horses from the Piacenza nobility. After concluding an armistice with the Duke of Parma, whose territories he had so casually invaded, Napoleon sent to Paris 20 paintings, including works by Michelangelo and Correggio, as well as Petrarch's manuscripts of the works of Rome's greatest poet, Virgil. One dark evening, Napoleon happened to come across an enemy straggler, a veteran captain in the Austrian army. Without revealing his identity, Napoleon asked him in Italian how things were going. Badly, the Austrian answered. They've sent a young madman who attacks from the right and left, front and rear. It's an intolerable way of making war. If he meant that Napoleon did not abide by the textbook and took advantage of every enemy weak spot, then the Austrian was correct. Beaulieu, realizing that the French have crossed the Po in force and now threaten to cut him off, orders a rapid withdrawal east. Milan is to be sacrificed. The great fortress of Mantua will be his next refuge. The French advance guard is soon in pursuit. The battle that Napoleon had sidestepped on the Po was instead to be fought on the banks of the river Adda. The Austrians were retreating towards Milan via the one bridge across that river at the little town of Lodi. And this is where Napoleon decided to intercept them. Beaulieu had left his rear guard there to hold it. Arriving in Lodi at noon on the 10th of May, French troops chased the Austrians across town and over the town's 200-yard bridge. But when they try to follow, they find the bridge is swept by fire from 14 guns, around 6,500 men in total. Napoleon commandeered the first two cannon he could find, brought them up to the bridge and directed the firing to prevent the enemy from destroying the bridge, manning them with his own hands. Napoleon sent for more guns and set up sniper fire from the riverbank and nearby houses. An artillery duel rages for much of the afternoon. Then, amid a shower of cannonballs and grape shot, Napoleon went to Reconnaitre. Near the river stood a statue of John Nepomuk, a saint who had chosen to be drowned rather than reveal the secret of the confessional. Concealed behind this statue, Napoleon studied the river through his telescope. It was not very deep, but it was rapid. The wooden pile bridge was 200 yards long and 12 feet wide. On the opposite bank, the Austrian guns were massed in a strong 15th century fort. Their batteries were arranged to command the whole length of the bridge by raking fire. Batteries stationed above and below also swept the narrow passage by crossfires, while sharpshooters, in their thousands, were posted at every point to drive a storm of musket balls into the face of anyone who dared to approach the bridge. Beaulieu had thought this position so impregnable that he had not thought it necessary to destroy the bridge as he easily could have done. It was as if he was daring the French to attempt to try to cross it. The Austrians were firing as Napoleon reconnoitred, and one of their shells exploded almost at his feet. But the statue of the saint took the full blast, and Napoleon escaped without a scratch. Massena's division has begun to arrive from the south, bringing his strength up to 15,000 men and 30 guns. 
Napoleon then entered the town, assembled his senior officers, and told them that he had decided to immediately storm the bridge. The bravest of them recalled from the idea and unanimously disapproved of the plan. It is impossible, one said, that any men can force their way across that narrow bridge in the face of such an annihilating storm of balls as must be encountered. How? Impossible? That word is not French, Napoleon exclaimed. There was no historical precedent for storming a bridge under heavy enemy fire, and his generals said it was madness, but Napoleon went ahead. This audacious act has been considered one of the most brilliant wartime exploits of all time. Characteristically, Napoleon would combine it with a flanking movement from his cavalry, who he ordered to secretly gallop up the River Adder, find a crossing, and surprise the Austrians by sweeping up on their right. Meanwhile, Napoleon gathered his infantry, 4,000 of them, in the town square. They were mostly from Savoy, and among them was a red-haired colossus named Dupas. Dupas was known for two things, physical fitness and a horror of cowardice, and it was this trait that Napoleon played on. His company of carabiniers had actually volunteered to lead the attack, an almost suicidal mission, and against any natural instinct of self-preservation. Yet it was this frenzied spirit, known as the French Fury, that often gave Napoleon an edge in battle, once his harangue had played on regimental pride and whipped up patriotic fervour. Napoleon rode along the ranks on a white horse. In a bid to spell on his troops, Napoleon used a touch of counter-psychology. He wanted to storm the bridge, he told them, but he didn't see how he could. He simply didn't have enough confidence in them. They would fool about firing their muskets and in the end wouldn't dare to cross. Napoleon nettled the troops, he goaded them, and at last, by six in the evening, he had worked them up to a pitch of courage. Then, Napoleon ordered the gate leading to the bridge to be opened, and drums and fifes to play their favourite anthem, La Marseillaise. On horseback, Napoleon posted himself by the bridge, and as the trumpets played, urged on his troops as they poured out of the square on the double, shouting Vive la République. The line merged into a dense, solid column. Shouting as they emerged, the French rushed upon the bridge. With the colossal Dupas striding in front, the whole head of the column was cut down, and those at the back were obstructed from moving forward by the piles of the dead. Still, the column tried to press on. Napoleon was constantly glancing upstream, waiting tensely for his flanking movement to arrive and surprise the Austrians from behind. Finally, the French cavalry appeared, very late because they had failed to find a ford, and came dashing down on the Austrian batteries from behind silencing some of their guns and allowing more French troops to cross the long wooden bridge. Napoleon anxiously snapped orders to his officers. Massena, Bertier and Lannes led a second wave of volunteers to rush down the long line of blood-drenched planks. The presence of their top officers was enough to inspire the soldiers and in the second attempt they swept across the bridge. When they had forced themselves halfway across, about 50 yards from its end, the French soldiers even jumped into the river to wade the last few feet to shore. However, the Austrians retaliated with a cavalry attack, which swept nearly all the Frenchmen who had landed into the river. The column began to hesitate, wavered, and was on the point of retreating. The French were very close to being dislodged from their position. One particular Austrian battery was causing havoc among the ranks of the French. Repeated fruitless attempts had been made to storm it. An officer rode up to Napoleon and told him the importance of making another effort to silence this battery. Napoleon snapped back. Very well, let it be silenced then. Napoleon, seizing a flag and followed by Lannes, Massena and Berthier, plunged through the thick clouds of smoke which now enveloped the bridge. Placing himself at the head of a body of dragoons nearby, Napoleon shouted, Follow your general! The bleeding, already mangled column, heartened by Napoleon's example, rushed with their bayonets towards the Austrian gunners. Lan, the gallant stocky Gascon, was the first man to cross the bridge in the face of a hail of grape shot, and Napoleon was the second man. Lan was already showing a curious indifference to wounds that would have put most men on their backs for a month or so. Lan recklessly spurred his maddened horse into the midst of the Austrian ranks and grasped a banner. At that moment, his horse fell dead beneath him, and half a dozen swords glittered above his head. Lan extricated himself from his horse, leapt on the horse of an Austrian officer behind the rider plunged his sword through the body of the officer and hurled him from the saddle, fighting his way back to his comrades, having slain in the melee six Austrians single-handedly. This deed was performed right in front of Napoleon, and he promoted Lan on the spot. As darkness fell, the Austrians ran, leaving behind their guns, over 300 dead and wounded, and 1,700 prisoners, 
Miraculously, French losses came to less, with about 200 dead. Napoleon himself, however, reported that he had lost just 150 men to Austria's 2,000 to 3,000. Even though casualty lists and the counting of corpses undoubtedly told him the true numbers. The exaggeration of enemy losses and diminution of his own was to be a persistent feature throughout Napoleon's campaigns. This had, of course, been a feature of the writings of the classical authors with whom he was so familiar. Napoleon did not consider himself to be under oath when writing military bulletins. He has been criticised for lying in his post-battle reports, and the phrase to lie like a bulletin entered the French language. However, this information has been acknowledged as a weapon of war since the days of Sun Tzu. When he could, Napoleon gave the French people hard evidence of his victories, sending back captured enemy standards to be displayed in Les Invalides. But throughout his career, Napoleon displayed an extraordinary ability to present terrible news as merely bad, bad news as unwelcome but acceptable, acceptable news as good, and good news as a triumph. The Austrian retreat spelled the imminent fall of Milan, which in turn meant that the large, rich province of Lombardy was now in French hands. Napoleon reported to the Directory, At this moment, Beaulieu is passing through the Venetian states, many of whose cities have closed their doors upon him. I hope soon to send you the keys of Milan and Pavia. Since the beginning of the campaign, we have had some pretty hot encounters, which the army of the French Republic have met with audacity. But of all the actions in which the soldiers under my command have been engaged, none has equalled the tremendous passage of the bridge at Lodi. If we have lost only few soldiers, it was merely owing to the promptitude of our attacks and the effect produced upon the enemy by the formidable fire from our invincible army. Immediately after the battle, some of the officers met together and humorously promoted Napoleon, who had acted so bravely but who looked so young, to the rank of corporal. From that day onward, Napoleon, who had manned two cannons with his own hands, which was a mere corporal's job, earned himself an affectionate nickname that followed him throughout his life, the Little Corporal. This came from the hallowed tradition of soldiers fondly teasing commanders they admired. Julius Caesar's men sang songs about the bald adulterer. It was a nickname that Napoleon himself liked and encouraged, emphasising as it did his republican modesty. Even when he became the ruler and emperor of France, this honorary and affectionate nickname never left him. When Napoleon next appeared on the field, he was greeted with cheers of long live our little corporal. Napoleon exclaimed, with 20,000 such men, one could march through Europe. And a Gascon grenadier shouted back, If the little corporal will always lead us in that way, I promise that he will never see us in retreat. Napoleon had won the devotion of his men by the quality which speaks most deeply to a soldier in the ranks, contempt of death. After Lodi, all mutinous rumblings disappeared from his army, and that vital sense of his esprit de corps took its place and never left for the rest of the campaign. Not only an important military victory, the Battle of Lodi marks a new stage in Napoleon's personal development. It was during this time that the soldiers' and generals' superstitious adoration of Napoleon first began. His other recent battles have been won by strategic or tactical skill, but here, against heavy odds, Napoleon had incited a ragged army, for months ill-fed, to the very summits of courage and valour, and to eventual victory. At Lodi, for the first time, Napoleon became fully aware of his gift for leadership. Lodi was the birthplace of Napoleon's self-belief. Vendemier and even Montenot did not make me believe myself an exceptional man. It was only after the terrible passage of Lodi that the idea shot across my mind that I could execute the great things which had so far been occupying my thoughts as only a fantastic dream. Then was born the first spark of high ambition. From that moment, I foresaw what I might be. I no longer regarded myself as a simple general but as a man called upon to decide the fate of peoples. It was after Lodi that I felt the ground slipping from underneath me, as if I were being carried into the sky.